Hello, everybody. Welcome to our uh, creative learning webinar. It's a pleasure to uh, host you here tonight. We have three wonderful panelists, and uh, uh, we're uh, just absolutely thrilled to be able to bring them uh, with you. Uh, the way we're going to be structuring today is uh, uh, starting off with just a quick introduction about uh, our creative learning meetup series, which is now transitioned here in this time to webinars. Uh, and uh, a little bit of the history behind that. And then we're going to uh, move into 10 minute presentations by our three guests. Um, first, Smaro Chrysostomu from uh, the University of Athens, then Ying Chuan Yu from China Academy of Art, and then uh, my colleague Yan Yue uh, Yuan as well, uh, here from NYU Shanghai. And uh, today's focus will be uh, creative learning and teaching online. Uh, particularly in higher education, uh, and we have perspectives from music education, from art, from design and entrepreneurship here at NYU. So um, we have some diversity in, in topic and area, and so we're thrilled to have you all on as a, uh, attendees. And uh, please, uh, as you um, listen, uh, feel free to put questions in the Q&A function. Uh, and or in the chat. And uh, at the end, once everybody's had a chance to present, we are going to reserve the last 15 minutes of our hour webinar for uh, questions uh, and answers uh, from you in the audience. Uh, and we'd also like to take the time here just to announce our next webinar, which will be focused on creative learning online in K through 12. Uh, we have three presenters, uh, Anne Fennell from California, Michael Bidvinsky from Michigan, uh, and Michael Sobolak, who's here in Shenzhen, uh, all discussing the ways that they're trying to continue to create and promote creative learning uh, and teaching in their classrooms during this time. And we anticipate continuing this webinar series every two weeks. Uh, and you'll be able to go and visit our uh, website here at NYU Shanghai on our program in creativity and innovation at our meetups. And we'll be posting the recordings uh, as well as posting um, our future webinars. So we hope you'll continue to um, participate and share. And if you're at all interested in sharing some of the work you're doing, please reach out to us as well. Uh, we want to hear from you and we're happy to include your voices as well. And we're recording this webinar. So for those of you who aren't here uh, and watching this later, it's been recorded. And for those of you who are here, it's being recorded if you want to come back to it. So thank you. And now we'll play this uh, short video introducing our uh, past meetup series as well, and uh, who we are. One second. We host meetups to connect creative and innovative practitioners to share their creative designs, expressions, and practices. Since 2018, we have hosted six meetups during which we explored the future of creative learning talked about modern curriculum design of traditional Chinese music and even put together a storytelling concert featuring the music, lyrics and script created by children. We invited case presenters to share experiences around creative learning in Chinese rural communities and children and parents to share creative learning at home and educators and designers to discuss design thinking in and beyond higher education. Hi, I'm Alex Ruthman, a professor at NYU Shanghai in the program on Creativity and Innovation. Hi, I'm Yan Yue. I'm an assistant professor at the program on Creativity and Innovation at NYU Shanghai. Together, we founded and currently lead the CXZ Lab, or Creative Experience Design Lab. We are inviting you to our Creative Meetup webinar series on Creative Teaching and Learning Online. Welcome. Welcome. And now that uh, we've had a little short introduction to us, I'd like to uh, move right to our first guest panelist, uh, Dr. Smaragda Chrysostomu from the University of Athens. Uh, welcome, Smaro. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, is it okay if I start uh, sharing my screen? Yeah, feel free to share and, uh, and go in. Yeah. Okay. Okay, hello all, dear friends and colleagues from around the world. Firstly, I would like to thank Alex Ruthman 
and the NYU Shanghai program for this invitation and for offering me the chance to participate in this wonderful series of meetups that are so topically organized, and particularly this first online webinar of the series. Um, dear friends and colleagues, we find ourselves in unprecedented circumstances. Our societies, our lives are forever changed in ways we cannot even fathom at this point in history. No doubt world history will from now on be divided into the period before and after this pandemic. The opportunities for global and instant communication offered to us by digital technologies are no doubt the key to operate, manage, and eventually overcome difficulties and obstacles. And I am grateful for what we have in our armor, and I welcome every opportunity to learn more. I will very briefly describe the situation currently in Greek education and will focus on difficulties and challenges, some of which are specific to my country, but also opportunities that emerge for future development. Our educational institutions, schools and universities have shut down on March 11th. Currently, the latest date given for their opening is May 10th, but it is expected to be extended further. Primary and secondary education in Greece is the responsibility of the state and therefore the Ministry of Education has been working non-stop to provide the necessary tools so that lessons can continue online. There are platforms available and all teachers and pupils are uh, provided with their own account to register and participate in various approaches and applications uh, available on those platforms for asynchronous and synchronous teaching. However, all those resources were used by a very small percentage of teachers, mainly IT specialists, or uh, those with an interest in using digital technologies in their teaching. And even that percentage used them as an alternative approach, auxiliary to their main classroom lessons. It is not surprising then that the system could not support the surge of use by hundreds of thousands of teachers and pupils trying to access those tools during the working hours of the day. In the first at least couple of weeks, uh, teachers found themselves staying up all night in order to be able to upload work and assessments organized in electronic classrooms when the system was less busy, usually between 3 to 5 uh, a.m. Now things are slowly uh, finding a pace. Secondary education is already working in both asynchronous and synchronous ways particularly upper secondary and pupils expected to prepare for their university entrance exams. Primary education has so far been working mainly in asynchronous ways and they will begin synchronous teaching shortly when our um, Orthodox Easter vacations will end on the 27th of April. Of course, as you can understand, this is a gross, this gross description of the situation. There are private schools that have started teaching fully in both synchronous and asynchronous ways from the very first week of quarantine. There are teachers that have never moved to synchronous teaching. There are pupils that have no internet access or have never signed into their electronic classroom. And also secondary subjects like the arts are offered in a smaller percentage, smaller percentage of schools and mainly asynchronous. This short overview of the situation in schools is pertinent to the music teacher education module uh, of our syllabus, which is the focus of today's presentation. Students in our department follow a five-year course in music studies with the option to specialize in musicology, ethnomusicology, Byzantine musicology and music technology. As part of their course, in order to acquire their pedagogical accreditation, they need to complete a module of eight subjects that relate to music education and music pedagogy. Teaching practice is included with uh, two semesters spent in combination of university-based and school-based observations, teacher shadowing, practice teaching, reflection, and so on. They are obliged to fulfill hours in primary schools, secondary schools and secondary music schools. At the start of the quarantine, our students were in various levels of completion of their obligation for this part of their module. 
our first question was therefore whether we should <coughs> cancel the semester altogether. After discussions, we have decided to restructure the goals, assignments and assessment in order to adopt, adapt, adjust. However, our concerns and skepticism are valid and still alive, and we keep debating the issues because there are pros and cons in all scenarios. The difficulties faced, firstly, relate to the mandatory teaching and observation. As students are in various levels of completion, there are uh, the main issue we faced here was how to equate classroom observation and classroom teaching with online synchronous and asynchronous approaches. What could count as observation? What could count as teaching practice? And what about reflection and pedagogical skills? Another important group of difficulties that we faced relate to technology. Students' access to hardware and fast internet, their skills and familiarity with the use of various applications and platforms, and of course the cost of some of the services provided by various companies that specialize in online teaching, presentation tools and platforms. As the quarantine was imposed in an urgent way, students had to leave their university accommodation and their flats. Not all have access and or hardware in their family homes, in villages and home cities. The phones that they have and they use, most of them are very limited in accessing the material and completing assignments, as you can understand. In addition, not all students have the same skills using digital technologies and applications used in online teaching. There are very different levels of familiarity with digital tools and actually uh, also different uh, mentalities toward those. Lastly, each institution had to make arrangements and cover the cost of services and platforms for, so that all of us, students and staff, could work and operate. And another important aspect of that relates to the accessibility issue of students, for students with disabilities. Nevertheless, there have been a number of opportunities that emerged uh, like the opportunity to acquire new skills, learn to use new applications, explore what digital technology can offer, the opportunity also to collaborate and work together, teach each other, create supportive communities, share resources and share ideas. And of course, uh, the opportunity and, uh, to realize the importance of open access material information and applications. I have mentioned earlier that there are a number of concerns related to our teacher education and teacher accreditation that have been raised through these, this transference to online only teaching environment. What type of skills are acquired and how do these compare with the pedagogical needs and skills that are included in our syllabus that are needed for future teachers? Are there maybe also important skills that would not have been acquired under normal circumstances? And what are those and how important are they? What has this experience taught us? Is there a need to redesign our teacher preparation courses? Are we preparing our students for the future? And what if the future is now? How prepared are they? How should we reconstruct our thinking for teaching online only each educational level. For example, what are the primary education specific issues that need to be addressed and how can we resolve them? Or what are the music performance specific issues that we are struggling with and how we, can we resolve those? This state of global emergency that we found ourselves in has so far presented us with a large list of difficulties. Through this crisis, though, it is important to highlight the lessons that we have learned so far and the opportunities for the future that even at this early point are evident. Personal and professional development is happening around the globe. Each one of us is working with our own selves, adjusting our expectations, adapting to new circumstances, exploring our strengths. We are learning something new every day acquire new skills, develop and expand our thinking. Communities of practice 
communities of, for support, professional communities, have emerged as a natural response to this crisis. And it became ed- evident that they can work in both physical settings as well as online settings. Digital technology is a powerful tool for the creation, continuance, and sustainability of such communities. And the quarantine situations that we found ourselves in, it is the only way. Each person is important. Different people have different needs. Flexibility, adjustability, and humane response are important if we want to be able to nurture healthy societies. For all education, all programs, levels, and systems, this is the ultimate goal. I would like to end this short presentation with an optimistic and positive note. I choose to highlight the importance of Ubuntu, the essential human virtues that have emerged throughout and because of this crisis. The importance of communities, of teams and cooperation, of empathy, solidarity, basic humanity, of understanding and acceptance. Because to cite one of our great Nobel Prize poets, Odysseus Elitis, if you can't find spring, create it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Smaro, for, uh, for, for sharing the perspective from Greece. Uh, so much of it resonates with uh, the experience that I've been having here this, this year, uh, this semester, and I, and I know several people in here are. So thank you for, for framing it, uh, both the challenges and the opportunities and, uh, and, and leaving us on, uh, on a positive note. We'll be coming back to these themes uh, shortly. Uh, now we'd like to have our next presenter, Ying Chuan Liu. Uh, welcome, and uh, please feel free to share your screen and uh, begin your presentation. And yeah, Ying uh, Chuan, do you want to unmute yourself first, so we, everyone can hear you? Yes, great. There we. Are. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Alex and Yan Yue, for offering me uh, this opportunity to join uh, this. Uh, a talk and um, shall I just uh, share my screen now? Yes, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, we can see it. Okay, um, I, I need to. Okay. Um, I'm Ying Chuan, and um, um, and thank you for Smero uh, for the last talk. And actually, um, apart from all the chaos that we've been experienced, and um, our class in the Academy of uh, China. Uh, Academy of Arts, ha- um, our class has been um, started for five, almost five weeks. Um, and um, um, today I want to talk about some more uh, from my experience um, of um, working with both college students and uh, children. So firstly, I want to share a story. Um, In my childhood, my mother was often sitting next to me and knitting with a bundle of wool on her shoulder and telling me stories. At that moment, the faraway narration seemed to take its form in the knitting hands and a certain kind of touch was imprinted in my imagination and memory. Later, um, I realized that Telling is not always about word and language, but also involves all sensations of the body. Weaving and sewing and embroidery have also become my language. And many years later, I realized that this creative experience I pursue in my practice, the narrative through time and space and materials, um, the internal communication between people, and the life experience through imagination and reality, perhaps all related to this childhood memories. And um, 
actually all my work related to education started with this book. Um, I actually did my BA in Beijing, um, China Academy of Fine Arts in Visual Communication. Um, at the time during my graduation, I, I was really lost courage for my BA education. Um, just be really honest here. So um, I decided to go abroad to see what it's like in the UK and just for trying things out, um, I went to Royal College of Arts, studied as textiles for MA. And in the second year, I had a crisis that um, I thought maybe I should change a discipline because fashion textiles and textiles for consumption is really not um, what I enjoy doing. So after my MA at, gradu um, at graduation, I came back uh, to Beijing and had no job and totally lost. Until one day, my friend in the theatre education institution asked me to make a workshop with children. Um, was the first time I started to using yarn and um, most ordinary material to narrative and to communicate with people. So this is the story of war. And. Um, Actually, I did this workshop in different places in China, um, mainly in local communities. And basically it's about a yarn um, who is a kid, has been left alone at home uh, and had an imaginary journey. And this is the book. Um, so it, it, was, it basically in broadened on the soft felt. So I embroidered all the soft characters and made the move um, through every page. At the end, the protagonist, the blue yarn um, that you can see on the screen came out of the book and moved into the reality. And what always happened um, by this time um, is that my, my, my little audience would believe they are the, the blue yarn now and I started to play with it. Um, so in this way, we move um, to the creation part of the workshop. Um, and this was I, uh, when I did this workshop in uh, Shanghai. And because this place was based, is based on, uh, it's back, it's a um, vegetable market. So, our play is basically um, unfolded um, from this vegetable market. And this was the, the children uh, leaded by the blue yarn and tried to find uh, the home of the yarn. And our play um, was basically wrapping things around and even make a mess like every child do. Um, and um, actually this little girl, what she was doing is wrapping people. And they even uh, started wrapping around the, the whole um, building on the street. And all of this, are, I haven't planned them at all, um, are totally the creation um, from the children. The wrapped vegetables um, and the furnitures. Um, I also, I uh, did this with uh, autistic children, um, and which was another amaz amazing experience. And this is the, the inside of the book. Um, I think the experience I got from working with children um, makes me 
want to explore how to combine this narrative and materials um, and making and playing process to further explore how making can extend our perception and our body. Um, and if our body can see and can express and can sense what is the place that making through and with our body. Um, and I think in the time of such incredible technology extension that brings perception across the world, like what we are doing now, um, I think I want to ask what is the place that making by hand? Um, so from working with the children to working with the college students, um, I ask uh, myself the same questions. And I think to answer it, um, the best way is to play and to experiment. Um, and actually, I only started to, uh, to join in to work in CAA um, for, I think, less than a year. Um, and these are some small projects that I did with my students. Um, this one uh, was, was uh, last semester. And basically the topic is to explore materials. Um, uh, so what I did is um, first we, we had a, a uh, how can I say, uh, a play that I called, called it a play. So the students, they divided into diff different groups and they uh, invited, they are invited to choose different material and react with it. And this was the uh, video. But it's a, a bit too long, so I will just uh, jump. And they and and then they are uh, they were, um, so move from the play uh, part, and then they they started to use try uh, uh, try to use materials to describe uh, emotions and more abstract uh, things, and then come back to the play again. So basically experiment, uh, experiment with the material. And those are what the students um, did with uh, basically different ways um, of dealing with the materials and try to use them as a language uh, to describe things. And these are all the uh, making progress. So um, from what they, what the the previous steps, uh, the outcome was um, every group have um, a small objects um, designed for the body. For example, this touching hand. Um, so they think the hand can offer the comfort and um, also a joyful experience. And a man wanted to have a lonely outfit um, for, for keep him alone and also to have a private conversation with other. And these are the uh, making progress of the students. And this uh, is um, a record of, of the whole uh, journey.
But just to keep the the ten minutes time, I will uh, just to jump that part. And this is the current project that I was uh, I'm doing with the first year students uh, called the choreography of the everything. So basically, um, the, the the subject um, I'm trying to draw, uh, trying to bridge different fields. Um, from physics and to, to motion um, and to space, dimension, um, and so on. And at the end, the, the students are working with their final project is to explore their inner space. Um, and the whole class we did uh, and actually we're doing now is online and this you can see is the a daily classroom uh, which I called um, rest, restaurant rice classroom um, and you can see it, it's quite different from before um, how we um, our class and now is really all everything is on the screen. Um, but we also did something fun with, again, the thread. So actually this workshop, I invited every student's um, family member to teach the crochet. And afterwards, um, they, every one of them started their personal project by, um, for example, um, research the, their family uh, memories. And this is the student's first tryout. And all of it are the, the photos and videos are uh, recorded by the students themselves. And this um, is one of the students' current project. So she is making a soft scissor. And there's another project made by the students. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ying Chuan, for, for that and reminding us of the importance of materiality and making. And I love the, the, the work with the thread and you were able to still integrate that into um, moving to online and involving family. So um, wonderful themes to share with us. Uh, now uh, we have our final presenter, uh, my colleague Yan Yue. Feel free to take it away. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm so thrilled first of all to hear um, both the former speakers and I think we can spend a whole night with with each of you and I also love what Intran just mentioned about this bringing uh, into other members of the learning community I have also uh, experienced similar things with students mentioning how now family becomes part of this um, for online learning um, so what I'm going to share very quickly is a tiny tiny part um, of my teaching and it's almost taking a micro uh, level view uh, and I had this idea because I always wonder uh, as a very young teacher I've been teaching in high ed for around three years now so I'm still exploring and I'm always wondering how people actually start their every lesson right well, what do you do in the first five minutes and ten minutes uh, and at the beginning I start exploring I also start experimenting but what I'm going to share is um, some of the thoughtful reflection that I have been doing now that we've shifted to online and I want to um, first of all say that I do really think that there isn't much difference between online and offline. This is um, perhaps not my way of dividing teaching to online or face-to-face. -face. Um, that's one parameter, but um, as, as Mara also mentioned, we have definitely seen new opportunities coming up. So a bit of background uh, of my teaching, I'm teaching project-based learning, a small size, eight to 20 students usually, and I'm teaching uh, design thinking and entrepreneurship export. 
Um, the name really doesn't matter. Um, what matters is um, usually students are divided into teams and then they work on a project, they identify a problem, they narrow it down and they do field work, they do research and then they create their solution and they test it and then they present it. So that's a, a little bit of background and I want to also share here that um, there is um, research that shows if we faculty teach uh, online and we have this experience, we can become better instructors in our face-to-face -face courses. Uh, and I've also seen examples of students actually build up their confidence uh, of online learning and a lot of self-regulated learning that is happening uh, now. So um, very quickly, as I mentioned, I always wonder how do people start their every lesson? What happens in this five minutes? And this is a very simple analogy that we know in sports. Uh, when we start doing anything, we need to warm up so that we won't hurt ourselves, we won't strain too much um, of our muscle. Um, so I'm using this example to uh, refer to my teaching as well. I always call my first five to 10 minutes um, warm up. And um, when I first started teaching, um, like a lot of other teachers, I have I always felt this anxiety, this internal clock ticking, talking um, that I have to finish my plan, that I have to cover this and that, uh, and always keep watching the time, <laughs> you know, um, just um, is afraid whether I'm going to miss anything. Um, it's only till recently that I actually, you know, uh, as I build this experience, I start to slow down, I start to calm down, and I really would cherish this first five and 10 minutes to help connect me and the students. Uh, at the beginning, I used that I just um, use this exercises because sometimes it's late at night teaching, sometimes it's afternoon, so I feel students are not really focused, they're tired, um, they wanna take a nap or, so this is the, I first build these exercises um, to kind of, you know, really get them doing something. Sometimes it's physical. So I will show uh, a few examples of how um, I designed these uh, first five minutes exercise and also how I slightly modify that for uh, my online teaching. So um, this is to refer to this concept that a lot of the educators here would be um, very familiar with. It's called um, Zone of Proximal Development um, by Bogowski. So uh, it's about, as teachers, how we can help students to move from things that they cannot do uh, and to things they can do with a bit of our help. So uh, in straightforward terms, if you have someone who can already walk, how can you give them some support so that they can learn to run? And I will show you now uh, some of the examples of my warm up exercises. And um, these are the three points I want to make. So um, the role now is my thoughtful reflection. I think they uh, play these three roles and obviously they are overlapping um, each other. So um, they serve as pre assessment, they serve as a way of connecting me and the students so we have a common language and collective memory. And sometimes it's also um, a method I use to do some reinforcement exercise based on the feedback I hope to give based on students' performance and their assignments. So the first example um, is what I call a paper clip uh, exercise. Some of you might know this is um, a two minute challenge. I designed as two minute, you can do it one minute as well. So students need to write down uh, as many um, ideas as possible of what they can use paper clips for. So there, there can be a lot of different ideas, like you can use it to um, pick locks, you can use it to make jewelry, um, make a button, uh, a lot of different possibilities. So uh, this is to actually see how students can use divergent thinking and also make a point um, that I hope as designers, they can start to change their mindset from whatever, sees, uh, whatever things they see, not asking a question of what it is, but asking a question, what can I do with it to open up the possibility of how we approach things and uh, look at things. Um, but I don't say it, I first introduce this exercise and then we reflect on why we do this exercise and students will kind of get to, to know this and get to um, experience this themselves. And a similar uh, exercise is a 30 circle challenge so um, student, uh, in face-to-face -face classroom, I will print this out. Um, but now online, I also show this on the screen and students can um, draw that on their own um, notebook or on their own screen um, to turn these 30 circles into as many possibilities as possible. Uh, and you notice totally different um, things that students do. So this is an example that I will show them. And similarly, um, I want to make a few different points. So 
Uh, one point, for example, some students want to reflect on what is design thinking, what is creativity, what is divergent thinking, they would mention a term that is think outside the box. And it's, it's not too new, right? We, we all say that. Um, but do they actually draw out of the circle? So uh, I would ask them to check in their own joy whether they draw some of the circles um, outside the circle or, and whether they actually connected multiple circles. So that's for them to reflect on when they mention uh, what is creativity in their mind, how they connect their um, like definition of creativity to what they actually practice. And also make a point about the balance and trade-off between quantity and quality, because sometimes students would pay too much attention on their quality and they really draw very delicately um, on one circle. So they don't have time to actually finish the 30 circle in uh, as well two minutes or one minute. Um, so this warm-up exercise at the very beginning of my class, they are not graded. So I hope students can really you know, enjoy themselves, do some experimentation. So it's like a pre-assessment for me, um, but there's no risk for, for the students. So it's relatively low risk. And then a second example um, I want to show is how I build this connection. And I feel this first five minutes with student online is even more important than in a face-to-face -face class. So I, I just slightly changed this exercise called just join together, uh, a collaborative join. So we used to do that uh, on a whiteboard, um, but I just found this very easy uh, tool called DrawChat. It's just, uh, it will uh, give you um, a website a URL so you can share with students and everyone will going to see the screen. And instantly I see everyone start doodling together and they just, they just love it, this, this experience and seeing others doodle. Uh, and then we started this proper drawing together, uh, which uh, I will give them prompt. So the first prompt is to draw a human face. So this is an example of as a class of 10 uh, and me together, this is what we drew together as a human face. And the second one um, in relation to this situation is uh, we draw what we imagine people will be doing to celebrate after the whole um, coronavirus is over. So uh, each of us added something on the screen. Um, this is, I can see from students, they, they like this because you know, it's, it's kind of relaxed when we do the Zoom call at the beginning, each of us are contributing something. And the second exercise um, is what I modified from um, an in-classroom uh, warm-up exercise called um, random um, or creative categorization. So in a physical classroom, I will have brought in a lot of different random everyday objects. I, I also love this materiality um, in the teaching. I want students to also touch and play things around. So I put a lot of different things like a tissue, boxes, um, paper, pens, uh, et cetera, on the table. And I ask each team to come up with as many ways to categorize different things as possible. Uh, and they need to think about how to categorize them in creative ways. So to give you some examples before they came out ways of things you can buy in convenience store um, or things you can buy in supermarket uh, or in other places or things that are children friendly, for example, that is soft and things are not children friendly. They are shop, they might hurt children. Um, and now on the screen, I use um, something called mural.co. So it's like a collective whiteboard. And I've just moved a few symbols on the screen and also ask students to move things around and categorize them. So every student can enter this room and see what other students are doing and categorizing them. So for example, there is a student who mentioned um, that there are uh, things with round, with circles, like all these are circles, or things you can do outdoors and indoors, things you can do alone, or things you can do with people together. Um, so this is categorizing things. It's first, it's about again, building this learning community, having this common language, um, but it also serves the purpose of connecting other learning outcomes and feedback I wanna to give to students. Um, because when we are doing projects, we always have our own uh, kind of established mindset of how we categorize things, whether this information is useful or not useful, whether it's related to my project or not related. So I want to kind of um, break them free from this um, entrenched mindset and really to explore things and look at them from um, different ways. So this is a second um, example of um, building this community together, building this connection with students, um, create this common language and collective memory. And my last example um, is how I use this exercise to give student feedback and do some reinforcement exercise. 
So I added this mind map called free association, uh, uh, sorry, this um, warm up exercise called free association, because I noticed when students are creating a mind map of their project, uh, this is the stage where they can think freely and use divergent thinking to create as many branches on a ma mind map as possible. But I noticed they um, are kind of restricted in what is directly related to a keyword, a key term, for example, online community. And they think about user, they think about WeChat, et cetera. Um, but I want them to really think wildly. So we did this exercise called a free association. I just pull out a few random pictures from the internet and I asked them to just throw out words they can think of. Um, and it's better that it's not directly related to the picture. So for example, this um, at the beginning, uh, we talk about bathroom, we talk about water, uh, wash your hands, but can we actually move from there to, for example, um, other association that is farther away from the picture, like health, it can be mom, it can be care, uh, it can be soap, even though we don't see soap here, it can remind us of soap, it can be shower, uh, can even be nurse um, at this point. So um, this is my last example of showing, um, sharing, uh, how I use this warm up five, five minutes to 10 minutes to give student feedback um, of what I hope them to do in their everyday assignment and exercise. Um, so this is the three um, kind of reflection, three points that uh, now that I reflect on why I do this uh, warm up exercise, um, these are the three goals that I hope to achieve. And I want to end my uh, presentation with um, this quote from Maxim Green, uh, an educator I I really uh, appreciate and admire is learning is uh, stimulated by a sense of future possibility and by a sense of what might be. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm aware of the time, so I will um, stop here. Sure, thank you, Yanyue. Uh, it's great to see all the experiments that you're doing to try and pull uh, what you were doing face-to-face -face in class into the online world with some tools and uh, and working with that, and that's a theme kind of going across all of our presenters. And I, um, just as kind of my first question to you all before we open it up to questions, and I do want to suggest now that if any of you who are attendees who have questions, start putting them in the chat or putting them in the Q&A, and we'll come to them uh, in, in just a bit. But I'd like to tomorrow start with you and going back to like one of the first, one of the big themes that you raised here was that um, because of this situation of having to put courses online and work in this new kind of paradigm, um, there's now new skills that are being developed or there, there's things that we might not have had uh, show up as, as learning outcomes or possibilities. And I'm, I'm wondering if you might uh, maybe start by maybe talking to us a little bit about uh, what you're starting to see in your own practice uh, in, in the Greek context around that. Yes, oh, thank you. And thank you both. Um colleagues for the wonderful presentations, uh, very creative ideas and use of online teaching and space. It's, it's, it's wonderful to, to have the chance to, to look at all this. Um, well, uh, new skills um, relate to different areas. Uh, new skills in terms of um, learning to use the digital tools and the technology uh, for teaching and learning that we haven't been able to do before. Um, new skills in terms of new thinking skills because we try and uh, uh, are obliged to find new ways of thinking uh, about uh, teaching uh, goals, learning goals, um, modes of learning and modes of, of teaching and modes of assessment and um, so it's uh, in every area it seems that uh, we are doing new things now and uh, acquiring new thing new new skills i find myself learning uh, a new tool every day uh, testing out a new platform and uh, uh, testing out all these wonderful applications that i see uh, being posted online by you alex or by all our colleagues from around the world so it's uh, it's a learning experience i think for everyone involved yeah that's a really kind of interesting point to come back to that, that it's 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 creating an opportunity to, for teacher creativity to come through and have to reinvent and think through yes. and, and and come through that uh yanyue or ying chuan do you have anything you'd like to add i i kind of notice um for students particularly um how they respond to this learning community to their peers really changed. Um, one advantage I notice is for more introverted students, because we are online and sometimes we do 
less speaking uh, and more typing, I can actually document and see every student's response instead of before. Um, I also do that, but I kind of need to explore how to um, navigate the different tools in class with the learning response system. Um, but online, it's, it's much better because everything is um, documented and students can see other students' response. And in a synchronous uh, session, I see some students, they are not too active at the beginning, but then they see other students posting very good quality responses. So they start responding to that. So I think that's definitely a, a big advantage for students. And I also um, am wondering whether um, in Trend can add a little bit on the, the customer survey thing. Was <laughs> very interested in that because I think uh, our teachers, we are you know, forced to be more versatile. We're like, not just a teacher, we need to be there, you know, uh, we need to support students emotionally. Sometimes at the very beginning, they are, they are very anxious. Um, and students ask all sorts of questions and we need to be our own technician fixing all the technical problems. And I think our instructor's role kind of expands. So I'm very interested in what Intra mentioned, like we are now kind of creating this customer experience as a whole. Um, thank you, Yin Yue. Um, well, I'm still trying to organize my language. Um, I think at the beginning, um, actually, I was refused, uh, mentally refused to do this online class because I always think that making by hand, uh, like it, it requires a face-to-face -face experience. Um, but until, uh, until we had this online classroom, um, that I realized it's the screen, it's, it's a new medium. Um, really to for us to construct a new space of teaching and learning together um, and, but it, it, it gets crazy sometimes like I showed um, for example every day because we all move to like online um, what do we see like the sh uh, we have um, well, how do I translate it? Uh, it's a Chinese kind of version of Google Doc almost where everyone can collaborate and, and write. Yeah, so we have different version of, of Google Doc. Um, and we still get into um, familiar with each of the function. So every time I need to jump to different um, app to see everyone's journal um, and to gave them feedback. Um, so it's, it's really messy sometimes. And I found I, I sometimes spend hours and hours just to reading uh, students' uh, writing and to give them a review and to watch their video. Uh, yeah, mm, so I think it's, um, it's both good and sometimes um, frustrating, I think, um, but because um, because everyone is at home now, so I set it. I set the topic um, that they need to work with the family. So I think the good thing of this is I can really um, get to know everyone um, from their childhood and even. Um, the fam uh, like the, the uh, childhood of the family members. Um, so reading their stories um, is is quite touching, and I think it's a kind of um, um, 惊喜, um of this uh, online teaching experience. 惊喜, how do I say that word? Just a prize or yeah yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. And, and kind of building on that, there's a question uh, directly for Sparrow um, about how has your university dealt in practice with the social discrepancies in internet access? I mean, it seems from some of the opportunities here in China that I've seen that there's been quite a, quite a lot of access, but I know that's not the case everywhere. Um, so that's to you, Smaro. Uh, yes, thank you uh, for the question. The, um, there, is, uh, there is a gap. Uh, in, 
in how different generations and how different uh, groups of uh, different socio uh, socioeconomic background use or have access to the internet and the software and the hardware. And um, well, my, uh, my institution has been trying for for the for the very first day to give us to give to us access to as many different platforms. Uh, as they can, and uh, so that we can use different tools. And some some platforms need more in, more um, uh, faster internet, for example. Or for for some platforms, it's easier to access them through the, the mobile devices. Uh, so we have been trying to have different uh, tools in our hands, but still, we have to figure it out as we go along. Hopefully. Um, this quarantine period will end and we will have some time for face-to-face -face teaching uh, to cover all these areas that we weren't able to cover online. But uh, we don't know how things uh, uh, will play out. Uh, we are trying to do our best and that is why I think that it is important to keep in mind that different people have different needs and we have to um, give each one what they need and find a way and uh, uh, develop this more humane, um, uh, let's say, uh, I don't know, response. Uh, it, it is not, it is, for, for me, it's not a matter of being strict or being very um, uh, rigid in what uh, the outcomes should be or the goals that we have set uh, in the beginning of our courses or in the beginning of the semester uh, should be. We have to uh, adapt and um, it is a way for learning all of us, for, for all of us. And um, it is interesting, I wanted to, to add to the, uh, to the previous question about the skills that we have found out, at least it, it is apparent to us, uh, that we need to change the way that we've been using technology. Uh, it is a question, of, it's not a question of what technology we have, but it's a question of how we use the technology that we have. So it's, uh, it, is, it is more clear to us now. Now that we have, we have seen that uh, our pupils, for example, might have a very expensive uh, phone, but uh, don't have access to a laptop to be able to do basic work. So um, it, they might have the latest application on their phone, but it's, it's, it will not help them to uh, you know, do the assignment or um, download a PDF document, you know, all these things. So it's, uh, uh, it is something that is interesting. It's a learning experience for all. Yeah, it's been interesting to listen across here that, I mean, some of the, particularly in uh, Yingchuan, you know, the, the idea of, you know, you have this book and then you have something material that comes out of it that continues the journey and then um, going and documenting learning. I mean, I think there's some some opportunities here that, you know, certainly connecting live can be quite a challenge for a number of people, but is there a way to send that assignment out to go out and capture and document and then share back when you can and, and work with that asynchronously? Uh, we also have a quick question, uh, a comment from uh, one of our attendees, Lulu, uh, who says, as a student myself, I personally feel that the biggest challenge for me to shift towards online learning is conducting teamwork. How you, uh, how you as learning, how do you as learning designers better design mechanics to sustain those collaborative work and how would you evaluate that work? So I think that's a really interesting question to kind of put out here is that, um, you know, what are some strategies for having more collaborative activities when people are distributed that and then how do you uh, evaluate the success of that uh, as we move forward in this time. Uh, who's the question for? I, anyone? Anybody. Feel free. Dive in. Um, I will. I th I think that uh, uh, collaborative work and cooperative work is very important, either in person or online. And uh, there are tools to do that. I mean, there are a number of a number of tools and uh, applications embedded within the online platforms of teaching to um, to separate into smaller groups, larger groups, uh, give out assignments, um, assignments that can be done. Uh, 
uh, in their own time in asynchronous or even during the online synchronous teaching so it's it's something that can be done and should be done because it's uh, i think it's a pity to waste uh, to lose this kind of of group work that you do within the classroom uh, and we have to encourage it online as well yeah, and Yanyo, you've been exploring a bunch. Of, you mentioned the Draw Chat and the Mural.co. Are there others out there that you've found useful that you could share with us? I, I would say even in everyday, like face-to-face -face teaching, um, I always stress to students, um, of course, that that's like the bottom line, I use Google Doc um, because it just gives both instructors and students a very clear record and documentation on Google Doc, you can see, and a lot of other uh, collaborative tools, you can actually see who is contributing what. Uh, you can track every record, but that's like the bottom line of whether anyone is contributing. Uh, and I, I don't have a like definitive answer because teamwork is definitely my biggest challenge for this semester. Uh, it's always a challenge, but for online, it's even a bigger challenge. So I'm, I'm doing, I can say two things. First of all, um, I also, like in Triumph, I've changed the topic of, of the semester um, design challenge to just reflect the current situation um, to give a topic that students can relate to. So I give students two topics to choose from. One is online learning, and they themselves under that bigger topic actually selected online teamwork collaboration. So they have this like metacognitive exercise going on. And the second, I noticed for the first semester, um, there are some little problems in teams and some members are not so active and they don't always want to talk to me. So um, I, I just started what I call a peer review buddy. So um, students from two different teams will, will pair together. So they will talk uh, with each other about their team and they will create a weekly um, kind of report. Um, it's just three questions so that they will document uh, what their peer review buddy says, what do, do they enjoy about teamwork, what they themselves will do and plan to contribute to their teamwork project. And I can see every weekly report to keep track uh, of how they are doing, not just from themselves or their own team, but from like a third person um, to give them advice and to supervise them. So I'll, I'll follow and see how that goes from, from this week onwards. Great. There's uh, one more question. I think that's all we might be able to have time for for this this uh, discussion, uh, and it's one, uh, the question maybe, uh, Ying Chuan, you might have some ideas about this uh, from, from what you've done, um, but the question is from Bridget, uh, how do you give differentiated learning support to different students in these on, in online courses as if things have been moved? Because you've talked about, many of you have talked about being more flexible in the ways you share and the assignments, but what about specifically um, individual modifications or re responding to differentiated learning? Sorry, is, is that the question for me? Sure. Um, uh, could you please repeat it again? Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's just more around, yeah, go ahead, Yangwei. Uh, it's in our chat as well, I think from Bridget Wu. So uh, how do you give different kinds of support um, to students with different needs in an online kind of setting? As you mentioned, we have like different um, maybe family situations, they have different, you know, experience and story and some students might need more support in some aspects, I assume. Um, to give support um, to different students with like different need, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, um, Basically, for me, it, um, it's because my topic, uh, before they have the, like, the final project topic, we all work with, in, we have 25 people divided in five groups. And um, so we have like everyday um, um, discussion with the five group and we use the Chinese version of the Google Doc. So every group can um, like see each other's um, reports, like Yan Yue side. Um, so at that part, that part I think uh, the students can answer their own questions. 
So it's, I found it's, um, it's easier for me. Um, uh, I can just be, um, um, how do I say that word? Uh, observer. Observer. Yes, observer, and to keep recording the words, and and uh, um, by the project move to uh, the the final part. So everyone, because I found it's really difficult for them to collaborate because they need to make stuff. So I came up with the idea that maybe uh, for this time it's better for them to do, to make stuff with their families. And even somebody, uh, some of uh, one student, she came up with the idea by using the string uh, we call the fan hua sheng. A type of rope? Yeah, a type of um, game that's basically you use a rope and you can have different hand gesture to to um, play with it and she used this game to play to interact with random people but uh, just around their um, community garden um, so I think it's the time for them um, to to really push them um, to try to make, to collaborate with different people apart from their peer, I think. Um, but the group um, discussion um, is getting um, not that um, active than before because they now are uh, working individually. Yeah, so like I this, think- Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think um, to keep like um, a review and, um, and, and share um, like um, regularly is, is, for example, once a week to get um, everyone back to the five groups again uh, and to present for others uh, might be a good uh, um, way to, to solve the problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, Adam has actually shared a really a related question here that I want to I want to read out to everybody in here, um, where you know his general question is: It seems uh, that since the beginning of the pandemic, some online behaviors are changing compared to how it was before. Uh, by what she means, not only their higher intensity, but shifts and changes on the map of s online social behaviors. For, exist for existence, his experience is that it's become much easier to have people attend online group meetings like discussions or yoga classes, but it seems slightly more difficult to get students interested in individual on online activities, such as submitting assignments or individual music instrument classes. People also seem to be less willing to reply to emails then attend a meeting on Zoom, which was exactly the opposite in his experience before COVID. So have any of you had similar observations of this? How much would you say this is community or country specific? Um, it seems interested about how the current situation might be changing how we choose to engage online uh, in different ways. Anyone wanna take that one? Um, I can start. Smart, do you wanna? Um, oh, so, um, I. I'm not sure whether it's it's country specific or not because uh, uh, in NYU Shanghai we have a group of like international students who have Chinese uh, half international. Um, so there are different tools, and uh, what I try to communicate to students is that I created a Slack channel. Um, so Slack is like a professional kind of um, chat. You can create channels, so it's more professional than social media channels like WeChat or, or Instagram. Um, so they can get more focused and I can answer questions, they can post questions and I can make announcements. But I notice students are very um, less active in Slack. Uh, and But I also notice they never respond email. Um, so what I want to communicate to them is I hope in the future, uh, both instructors and students will have this new skill to learn uh, like every semester throughout, you know, their undergraduate. And I'm also thinking maybe later we want to create one compulsory session for every course that is online, um, even when we can go back to face-to-face -face teaching so that we, each of us, each of us in the learning community can learn to, um, you know, work with different tools and use different media. 
Um, to me, go ahead, Samara. Go ahead. Yeah, to just to, to answer to to answer the question from the perspective of my experience. I mean, I don't know if it's country specific or it's me specific. Um, I don't see this behavior. I mean, yes, uh, I see the attendance uh, to the Zoom meetings for the class that the, the teaching online that has uh, is larger than the, the physical attendance i mean was before uh, but um, uh, i don't i don't observe the same uh, um, the incidents that our, our colleague is describing in terms of emails or responses i mean uh, if if anything people are writing and responding more uh, quicker because they are they seem to be 24 hours <laughs> online in front of in front of a screen or one type of screen so they sort of respond immediately almost so it's uh, we don't have the chance to meet in person so they don't wait for the teachers to appear in the university to ask them anything they just write it <laughs> send an email and expect the response no. great well, I think that's a great uh, spot to end on, and we want—I want to thank all of our panelists for coming in, and certainly thank you to all of our uh, attendees sharing discussion, a lively discussion in the chat room uh, from there. And uh, we'd absolutely like to invite you to uh, attend our next webinar, which will be uh, April 30th uh, at 10 p.m. So it'll start an hour later to better accommodate uh, some of our friends on the west coast of the United States. Uh, but again, be a uh, similar format here. We'll bring in uh, three uh, K-12 teachers this time discussing similar issues and themes that uh, they're working through. Uh, and um, thank you again for attending. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. And please uh, if, uh, follow uh, what we're working on at uh, creativityandinnovation.shanghai.nyu.edu is our website for the program on creativity and innovation here at NYU Shanghai. Uh, we will we'll be posting um, videos of these webinars and uh, hopefully uh, you'll all be able to continue your discussions uh, as we go from there. So uh, thanks again. Yanyue, anything else you want to say before signing off? One last comment. I think we missed uh, Cecilia Bijot's um, comment. Oh. It's a great comment to uh, end the session as well. Um, she mentioned about this interesting paradox that we are now interacting online, but you know a lot of the themes we brought up, uh, especially what Kim Trump brought up, is this human contact, family, and playfulness and materiality, uh, which seems to be like the opposite side of being online. But actually, we have more emphasis on that now that we are online. So we also hope this uh, can be a community, and people can start. You know, we expanded our network before our physical meetup can only accommodate. You know, at most ten people altogether. Uh, at the same place and same venue and it's almost impossible to have people around the world to share at the same time but now we we have this opportunity to bring more people uh, and to share uh, and learn from each other so i hope you will join uh, us for the future uh, webinars as well yeah thank you everyone for coming <laughs>